All right, Dr. Doc Matthews, how are you today, man? We, we've I'm been doing all- absolutely well, Matt. How about yourself? Well, I've been better because most of the time when people watch this, I got these great headphones on and this awesome recording stuff. But unfortunately, today's podcast is going to be different because I had a little cord that is not playing very well. So we're just going to be doing this live and then I'm going to get to the recording later. But I am so glad to have you on here. You are you're going to bring some great information, some great experience. Um, and we're going to talk about your book. But before we get into that, I just want to start and say welcome. Welcome to all the people who are here with us. Um, we love interaction. So if you have a comment, please throw it in the in the in the chat if you're on Facebook uh, and we will bring it up on the screen. If you have questions, if you have anything, throw that in there. We'd love you to be a part of the conversation. But but, Doc, let's let's hear about you. Tell us tell us the the Dr. Math, the Dr. Marcus Matthews story. You know, uh, I, I have to kind of take a back seat to something that happened today. Uh, my younger brother, he, he he lived with me until the night before his wedding. Right. And and he got married and, you know, moved into his home uh, for, for uh, the night of his honeymoon. And today his wife, who's she told me to stop calling her sister in law and just call her sister. And um her family, which is my extended family, experienced a murder uh, suicide today. And um, the, the, the troubling, it, it gets worse because this murder suicide happened in front of a nine year old and a five year old. So we're talking about two children who watched their father murder their mom and then kill himself. Uh, and again, this is my sister in law, my sister's first cousin. So uh, I got the call earlier today, and uh, of course, when I when I get done with this podcast, I'm going to see my family. Uh, and you know, it's I'm thinking about the kids. I'm thinking about the children, and you know, the work that I do around aces and around trauma. You know, it. it this is why it's so important. Because for these children, and I'm going to be honest, I didn't have the strongest relationship with these kids because I would see them at family functions, you know, and they're playing and running around the house. And, um, you know, but now the gravity is just, you know, making sure these kids can move forward. And, uh, you know, that's all I'm thinking about in in regards to, uh, of course, my condolences to the family. And I'm thinking about my sister and, and, you know, she's taking this very, very difficult because this is her uh, younger cousin, you know, who looked up to her and, you know, would come over and, and uh, eat with the family and, and, and that whole deal. And even the gentleman, uh, the, the man who uh, committed the, the, the crime here, you know, was someone who I spent time with. Uh, so it, it's, it's uh, definitely a heavy moment. And I wanted to make sure that, I was still able to be here to do this with you today because this is why what we do is is so important because we have children who have done nothing wrong. You know, we we have kids out here who who haven't uh, done anything but but woke up in the morning. You know, they, they didn't ask to be here. And so, you know, I. To, to segue this into who I am, you know, I, I'm a former teacher. I'm always a teacher. And when dealing with kids, I was successful in the classroom because I had a heart for, for what children were going through. And that allowed me to be successful in the classroom. I can remember my first full year of teaching and I was in this mentorship program that our district set up. For new teachers. It was awesome. Um, And the ELA specialist came in and said, you know, I wasn't doctor then. Uh, Mr. Matthews, you have a great rapport with your kids. Now we just got to teach you what to do in the classroom. You know, they'll they'll do whatever you ask them. And, um, you know, at that time, I think we're reading the autobiography of Malcolm X. And I didn't have any teacher skills as far as you know, knowing how to differentiate and, you know, being able to scaffold and, 
you know, how, how to incorporate that vocabulary. Uh, it, we were just reading the book and talking about it. And the students were so engaged. And I'm talking about 30 at a time in an urban environment. Uh, all of those uh, things that point to where you don't have a successful classroom atmosphere, low socioeconomic status, and uh, you know, grade level reading below uh, average and, and things of that nature. But we were able to have some great uh, discussions and learning opportunities and critical thinking uh, opportunities because I had a heart for the kids. And uh, I thought what happened in my classroom was happening in every classroom in the world, you know, because I was, you know, it, 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 even in the building. Um, and, and, and I loved where, I, you know, my, my first job, my teacher mentor, he came to my room. And he said, you know, you should be the one mentoring me because you've got this, you know, you've got it on lock. And, you know, the, the thing about it, when I ventured around the building, right, and, and then I would see the same students who were engaged with me and they weren't so engaged in other places, you know, I, I started to kind of question, you know, what what's the disconnect? Or I would, you know, you hear about certain students and they say, oh, man, you got Matthew. Oh, my goodness. Your hands are full this this year. But when I get Matthew, I don't have a problem with Matthew. And so I, I know that as much as I enjoy being in the classroom and working with students, I want more teachers to be able to have the success that I had in the classroom, because what that does is it affects more students. So if we can get you know, more teachers to be able to um, be culturally responsive and build rapport and be trauma informed, you know, by doing that, you know, and being able to incorporate social emotional learning into the curriculum, into the daily activities, uh, into that relationship and build relationships with students, then we'll have more successful classroom experiences. And, you know, that'll translate into, you know, the, the, the things that we use to, to measure your literacy, your numeracy and your graduation rate and all that good stuff. But, you know, more importantly, you know, we'll be reaching more students and keeping them uh, on, on track to that life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness versus, you know, a prison industrial complex. Well, it's interesting that you say that. And I know you're you're located in Memphis, correct? Right. So, so we're in Tennessee together. And I don't know if you've been following this new legislation, um, but but Dr. Doc, I'm just going to call you Doc because that's what, that's what we got. Doc, it is against everything you just said, right? And for the listeners, we have legislation in Tennessee that has already passed the Senate and the House uh, Education Committees. That is, when I tell you sitting us back 20 years, 50 years, it's that. Uh, where right now, it's not only can teachers use um, uh, uh, reasonable force against students to remove them from a class, uh, they can also, and it's recommended they call police uh, officers or SROs to remove disorderly students. And then after that, uh, teachers can petition to have these students taken out of their classrooms temporarily, permanently, or put in alternative schools. And that is in about to hit the Senate and the, the, the legislative floor here in the next couple of days. So when I heard you speak, what you said was polar opposite of even what our state is trying to do. And it, it, it tells the work that needs to happen. So let's get into your book because um, it, it, it has an interesting title and I think it's a title we need to have a conversation around and people need to understand why you titled it, what you titled it. And it's titled urban aces, right? How to right. read and teach students traumatized by adverse childhood experiences. Tell us about it. Tell us about the, the content, where, where you wrote it, uh, from, and I mean, in your heart, in your experience, tell us about it. Well, um, it came from a place of help. For me, I have done everything in life that I've set out to do, you know, outside of taking a couple trips to Africa, um, you know, and maybe having kids. But aside from that, you know, like coming from where I came from, I grew up in Fraser, 
which is in North Memphis. Uh, we experienced white flight. My dad is, is he he bought our he bought our house in 1978, and we were the second black family on the street. And this is two years before I was born in 1980. And by the time we left that neighborhood, uh, it was predominantly black. Uh, there were abandoned houses, there were drug houses, there were robberies occurring in the neighborhood. And, you know, we really saw the uh, turnaround uh, in, in a negative fashion. And for me, the urban, right, and when we think about the low economics and when we think about the poor educational system, right? The When we think about that part of ACEs, it adds to it. Now, when we talk about adverse childhood experiences, that affects everyone. If you were, and, and typically, you know, for, for those uh, who aren't really familiar with ACEs, we're talking about uh, household dysfunction, which could be dis divorce or an incarcerated parent, a parent out of the home. Uh, we're talking about neglect which could be physical neglect, emotional neglect. And then we're talking about abuse, could be sexual abuse, mental abuse, emotional abuse. It doesn't matter what you look like, that happens to everyone. So that in and of itself is, is something that deserves attention. And I'm glad that ACEs uh, are being addressed. I'm, I'm glad that adverse childhood experiences is, is a phrase that's becoming familiar in our conversation. But when you add being poor on top of that, when you add being the victim of systematic racism on top of that, when you add having a below average education on top of that, that's a different level of trauma. And the CDC has even gone on its website and addressed it and says that toxic stress levels are higher when we take those same uh, aspects into consideration. So it's not that I only want to help people who are in an urban environment. It's not that ACEs only happen in urban environments. It's not that schools in urban environments are the only schools that need ACEs training and need to be ACEs aware and need to be trauma informed. That's not it. What it is, is that we have to understand that it's a deeper level when we continue to add layers. And I, I, I talk about it like this, Matt. If you have a hamburger and you've got ketchup and mayonnaise on your burger and you're enjoying your burger, when I add lettuce and tomato, my burger's different. We both have a burger, but my burger also has lettuce and tomato and yours doesn't. So that's gonna be a different taste. This is a I'm probably gonna have to pay more, right? For those added toppings. So when we talk about adverse experiences, yeah, there's, there's a, a, a common theme, but there are also some other factors that we need to consider. And that's what Urban Aces calls to our attention. And I love that you address that because that is 100% a fact, right? We know adversity um, is a universal experience across all demographics, right? But but that doesn't mean that all demographics experience adversity the same way. And I think right. you're talking about experiencing systemic racism or you talked about the white flight, right? I'm experiencing it in my school neighborhood. Now it's the gentrification. So Everybody left at some point, and now everybody's trying to come in to get in the neighborhood, and it's pushing my families out. So there's different layers of what we mean by adversity, and I love that you're addressing that. And so how do you see, because right now, and I've had many guests on here um, uh, talking about a variety of topics from the neurodevelopment um, and trauma-informed education to racism and equity, right? How right. do you see equity is fitting under this trauma-informed umbrella? Because to me, it's just a part under the umbrella that must be there. Um, but how do you see that? What's that lens for you look like? Absolutely. And, you know, we, we still have people who are confused about the difference between equity and equality. And equality 
is a, a pretty simple concept of giving everyone the same thing, right? You get five donuts and I get five donuts. But if you're taking your five donuts and you're eating your five donuts, but I'm taking my five donuts to my family and my parents who live in a home with me and my brothers and sisters and their children, I'm not really, I might not even get a bite of a donut. I might get half of a donut. So it's equal, but it's not equitable. And so when we think about equity, that that's giving based on whatever is needed to achieve the goal. And I what, what I want to see, Matt, is a conversation about what is the purpose of education? Why are we educating students? Why do we have schools at all? Because if we go back to the beginning, we go to the root, right? And we start thinking about the 1600s and 1700s, we were teaching reading in order to teach people to read the Bible because that was one of the reasons that people came to America was for freedom of religion, right? And then we wanted to teach slaves certain aspects of the Bible so that they could be subservient, right? To obey their masters, those certain parts that we took out. And then once we started teaching reading, our industry stepped in and said, hey, we can have better workers, more informed workers, if we educate everyone. And so that was the purpose of primary education. The purpose of primary education was to create a, a more adept working class, a working class. Now, college education, that was more about critical thinking and, you know, that, that higher calling, that higher life. But for the everyday person, because everybody wasn't going to college uh, 400 years ago, just like everybody's not going to college right now. So for those who are receiving that primary education, it was to be a better worker. And is that really what we still want right now? Is that as, as America, as the United States of America in 2021, are we trying to produce efficient workers or are we trying to grow critical thinkers and problem solvers and innovators and entertainers and uh, what what are we looking to do? Why why are we going to school every day? What's the real purpose? And so that's the conversation that we really need to have on a on a national scale, and we need finite answers. So when we start looking at the mission and vision statements that we have in schools across America, we can be very clear about what it is we're attempting to do with our population. And I mean, that's valid. And he, let's be honest. How many times have you heard in education, college and career ready? Right. right. I mean, that's the foundation. It's where our, what the old standards came from. It's where the, it's where the current standards are going. And let's be honest. Let's go back to what you said, right? This was developed literally hundreds of years ago, right? Right. And yet we still continue. So when that was built, it was built on a white supremacy mindset. It, and that's the fact. And I think, too, that we could agree that we are continually fighting these fights of, wait a minute, what are we doing? And I think what the, the, the legislation I just spoke about that's going through our legislator goes all the way back to what you just said. Yep. Why are we educating? And, and it is very obvious that in our own state that there is a subset of students that they feel don't deserve an education. Well, and, and that's true, because without that... you. We have a prison industrial complex, right? And, and what that means is people are getting paid off of free labor. And this free labor is typically poor people. And guess what? The jail populations are predominantly black and poor, okay? So when we think about the parallel between the prison industrial complex and slavery is not a big difference. And even when we look in our constitution and we talk about the abolition of slavery, there's a but, there's a unless, there's an except 
when you're incarcerated, slavery is no longer illegal. So the more people that can populate prisons and jails across the country, the more free labor that's available to big industries, okay? And, and we know that this is happening. And we, we talk about the prison industrial complex. It, it exists in partnership with the school to prison pipeline. And that's that legislation that you're talking about. That legislation is the school to prison pipeline in the flesh, okay? Because this is what happens. And we're gonna walk the dog real slow, Matt, for the people in the back, okay? When you remove a student from class, it is reasonable to think, it is reasonable to expect that that student will not be on track with the rest of the class. If that student is not on track with the rest of the class, it is reasonable to think and to expect that that student will experience failure. If that student fails a class or multiple classes, it is reasonable to think that they will fail the grade. If students fail grades, it is reasonable to think that they are highly more likely to drop out. And that's not an expectation, that's the data. Our high school dropouts are students who failed courses in the past. They're not getting all the way to the 12th grade straight through and dropping out. The highest dropout grade is ninth grade, right? So these students have already been unsuccessful. And then, that straw breaks the camel's back, and now they're not in school at all. If, and we're still gonna walk the dog. If you're not in school, and you do not have skills that will allow you to make an honest living, it is reasonable to expect that that individual will get involved in criminal activity. If that individual is involved in criminal activity, it is likely to think and to expect that they will become incarcerated. Once incarcerated, you have been introduced to the prison industrial complex through the school to prison pipeline. All right, so we're, 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 we're and I see the note that said denied education is not teaching a lesson and I love that. The, the, the point of discipline is not to punish. Discipline is to teach. So we're not teaching the student when we send them home, when we send them out of the, the, out of the school building. We're not teaching. And so what we have to add and, and, and think about in terms of the message we're sending, if I don't know how to add, you teach me math. If I don't know how to find the main idea, you teach me English language arts. If I don't know how to behave, you send me home. Why don't you help me behave? Why don't you teach me how to behave just like you teach me everything else? That's you know, what the school is about. You know, interesting enough is that um, several years back, uh, NPR did a story on my school. And what I didn't know is they were actually butting it up against a uh, legislator uh, her last name was Butts, uh, that was saying that social and emotional learning shouldn't happen in school. It should happen in church and home. And to me, that blew my mind, right? Like that, that there is this expectation that everybody has a picket fence, that everybody has a uh, dinner around a table at 530 every night. And I think that that is, and, and just like uh, somebody just mentioned, that is school, Right. We're right. teaching the whole child. And when you talked about trauma-informed education, you talked about ACEs, and you talked about the experiences. When I read this, le this recent legislation, I thought, what if, what if the child that's disruptive is the child, the nine-year-old you spoke about at the very beginning of this podcast? What if that child goes to school in seven days, in 10 days, in 25 days? The expectation is they are going to be dysregulated because of their experience. Yet, the schools don't take time. A lot of schools. My school definitely does. Matter of fact, I fake phone called a paramedic today because a child was laying on the floor. And I said, oh, my goodness, 
I got somebody on the line. I don't know. Let me see if she'll stand up. Let me see if she'll go to see. She died laughing, got up, sit down, and had a great rest of the day. Right? right? Right. But that's not what that's not what current education systems are built upon. So how do we shift the paradigm? How do we begin to shift the paradigms in education around the things that you're saying we should address? People who care have got to stand up, Matt. People who care have got to stand up. When we when we look in the mirror, we know. And, you know, I, I look at what what's happened around the country over the last couple of years here. You know, we, we've had uh, this pandemic and we've had a social justice movement that has such a breath. We haven't seen this type of social reform since the civil rights movement, since the 50s and the 60s. We haven't seen this type of action. And I've been so pleasantly surprised by seeing the diversity of people who stood up to say wrong is wrong. Let's do what is right. Let's treat people right. Let's not kill people. Let's not shoot people dead in the street. Let's not choke people to death in the middle of the street. Let's not do that because it's not right. The same is the same has to happen in education. We have to say if children need help, let's help them. Let's not throw them to the wolves. Let's not just cast them aside and say, well, they're they're always haves and have nots. That's not what America is about. America is about everyone having the opportunity to be who they want to be, to be who they can be, right? When, when we even look at our armed forces, we say, right, be all you can be. That's what we that's what we ask our American brothers and sisters to do. Be all you can be. So the, the education system is the building block of America. So we should be nurturing our children to be all they can be. How can we nurture them if we kick them out? How are we nurturing them if we're removing them from the equation? Now, in a more uh, succinct uh, term, and that's you know really philosophical, right? But what we need is we we need more support in buildings. We need more people in those spaces who are ready to support, and we also need to better train teachers to deal with challenged students. So you know, and I started doing professional development by accident. You know, um, I got my first ACES training in 2015. 2016, 2016. And then I got my trauma informed training in 2017. I was a dean of students. And so I was sent by my principal to receive this training from the district. And the district had received this training from the state. And we were a trauma informed school because our suspension rates were so high. And we, we had these disruptive and serious behavior issues uh, in our school. So I went to the training and I was tasked with training my staff once I received the training. So I got a three day intensive trainer of trainers uh, training, the certificate and everything. And so I went back to my school and I was so passionate about what I had learned. You know, I, I realized that we have to approach teaching differently. It was a huge aha moment for me. And we embrace restorative practices. We embrace restorative circles. We embrace trauma-informed teaching, King and nonviolent conflict reconciliation. And we were able to reduce out-of-school suspension by 26% in one year. We were able to go from a level one school to a level five school. And for those who are not in Tennessee, one is the, the lowest and the high, five is the highest. So we went from the lowest performing score to the highest performing score and lower suspension rates by 26% in one year. Our principal the very next year was, was given the title uh, principal of the year. And for me, 
I knew I just had to keep doing that work. I had to continue. And that's when I wrote Urban Aces, right? Following that, and I, I took those lessons, those those concepts, those thoughts, and I, I, I thought about what had worked for me over the last 10 to 15 years as an educator. And I put this guidebook together so that more teachers and school districts could experience the kind of success that I was able to experience as an educator and that my school was able to experience. And most importantly, that those students were able to experience. You know, they I had a young man uh, and, and, and Keith Vaughn, would, he would come to me and say, I de-escalated myself today, Doc. I de-escalated myself. They had me upset. I was, I was turned up and, and, and I, I, I started saying my ABCs backwards. That's one of my favorites, you know. I, I get the kids to say their alphabet backwards and they usually don't get to R, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, but just, you know, just using those de-escalation, self-regulation techniques, just giving them an opportunity to calm down. Sometimes a student just needs to calm down. You know, and plain and simple. Honest, sometimes the adults need to calm down. I mean, and I think that that's the piece that we have to continue to have a conversation. You went, you said it earlier, teacher training. I was not a trauma informed principal my first year. You and I started our journeys about the same year. Mine was 9, 2015. I saw Paper Tigers. I was at a uh, the the Barbara Gay. Uh, Shout out to Jill Sport Leader. Hey. Shout out to Jim. <laughs> he's a of mine, and I know he's probably a friend of yours, right? And, and and the trajectory started. And here's how I felt. If I didn't do something different as an educator, I was committing malpractice because now I know there's science. Now I understand the neurodevelopment and the neuroscience. And what you're saying is kids celebrate success in a social and emotional health just like they do in an academic setting. But it comes down to two, regulated adults. Kids have to build the skill. And what I've learned is adults have to equally build the skill. And so we can't make this about kids, right? I mean, in my opinion, we have to right. shift the paradigm from the right. adults. The kids have always had trauma. We've always had troublemakers. Hello, I was one right. of them, right? Like, We've got to think about this as a paradigm shift for adults. And it sounds like you had that experience. So what was your experience with working with other colleagues, right? You were the dean giving that, that training. Cause I've been there as a principal giving the training and getting fired up and getting frustrated because people didn't get it. But what was your experience? You know, I really have to commend our staff. I think my passion was just so contagious that teachers had to give me a shot. You know, they just like, okay, he, he is so gung-ho and bought into this trauma-informed practice. Like, let's see what he's talking about. And, it, you know, we did have our growing pains. Of course. We did, we did have our growing pains. I can remember uh, Ms. Williams, by, uh, she was my teammate because I went from being a classroom teacher to an administrator. Of course, you know, you have, it has to happen in one year or another, right? So Ms. Williams was my teammate. And then the next year I was an administrator and she's old school. Like she's one of those old school teachers who was, you know, you, you, she's no, you're going to answer that question, Marcus. Nobody else is going to answer. You're going to get it right. You're going to look in that book and you're going to read it, you know, and we know that now, right. We can give students a pass and tell them, you know, they can go around. No, she was old school. And so I went to, uh, she, she, she said, he got to go, Doc. He got to go. And so we were able to discuss this, this student situation. And we, we were able to come to an agreement. And so the next time I dealt with a student, before I sent that student back to class, I, I, I physically walked to her room with the student. And I said, this is what we've done. This is what's been discussed. This is what he wants to say to you. And now I'm going to give you the authority in this decision making process because these are the options we have. And we, we have to bring our teachers with us. We, we have to bring 
our teachers weekly. We can't beat them over the head with uh, trauma informed practices. We can't beat them over the head with anything. You know, we're we're all free moral agents. So we we have to get that buy in, and that comes from relationship building. And that's one thing that I want to work with leaders on, right? With teachers, absolutely trauma informed care, restorative practices. But with leaders, we we have to be the type of leaders where this is the question. Ask the teacher what kind of principle they have. Mm-hmm. Don't ask the principal. You know, and it's the same concept where I learned, I heard a long time ago, they say, if you want to know if a man is a good husband, ask his wife. You know, so if, if you're going to lead a group of teachers, that group of teachers has to believe in you. And they have to believe in you because they see what you're doing. They see the effort that you're putting forth. They see that you are bought in. And, you know, there's nothing worse than the school leader walking in the front of the building and saying, we're being voluntold that we have to do this training. We're we're being voluntold uh, that this is what has to happen. Mm -hmm. Because that leader is saying, I don't believe it. Mm I don't trust it. Mm-hmm. So why do feel any differently? So my call goes to the building leader, right? And and even and and, and so just the same way we push stuff down, usually the, the, the crap we push down, right? And then on the way up, we push the praise up. I'm gonna go the other way around. I'm gonna push the charge up. I'm gonna push the charge up. Because we, we got to stop blaming the kids. The kids are innocent here. The kids are the ones who are suffering the most. And next we have the teachers. The teachers are not properly trained. Period. We must do a better job of training and preparing and supporting our teachers. Next, that's on the building leader. The building leader has to develop a rapport and build relationships and provide the proper training for those teachers. And then when we get outside of the building leader, now I'm going to the superintendent or the director of education or the whoever the title is that runs that district to say, you have to be able to look at your district and determine based on what will most help students, what kind of training do we need? And I'm going to tell you, uh, shout out to Rutherford County Schools, shout out to Laverne Middle School in Laverne, Tennessee. I went there and I was told this was one of the best PDs we've had in years. And I, I was I was told and, and you know, I've seen other I, I was a teacher. You know, you get the you, you get the same PD you got for the last seven years and the teachers are ready to go in their classroom and, you know, work on the wallpaper and get the lesson plans together because you saying the same thing you said last year. You're giving me the same handout and it has it, it hadn't had any impact in the last seven to 10 years. So we've got to do new PD. We, we've got to go at how we train teachers and districts have got to look at what they are prioritizing differently. I agree. And at the end of the day, right? that to me like what what i see as a school leader and you have been in that space too i have to model what i'm what i'm hoping to see and so even at my school you know a couple years ago we our mantra was pre-forgiveness in that we're pre-forgiven we're going to make mistakes we're going to struggle we're going to have a hard time but knowing coming and asking for support or saying hey i need help in this that that there's no shame in the game. And I think that that's what even as a leader, I had to model. I had to stand in front of my staff and tell them when I struggled. I had to stand in front of my staff and say when I needed support. And I think that we've got to get over this. We have to have it all figured out. And Lord only knows that during this pandemic, everybody has been thrusted into a space of we don't have it figured out. But what Absolutely. I can say is I've seen the most remarkable resiliency come from our educators changing the way we teach in the matter of just a few months, looking at education completely differently. And which is why I call this right now, there's a major, we are in the midst of opportunity when it comes to trauma-informed ed because the system is disrupted 
by an, a natural cause of COVID. It's time to now push the throttle. So let's say, hey, somebody says, Doc, I want you to come and support my school. How, how did they get a hold of you? How, how can they get a hold of you? Absolutely. Uh, www.marcuslmatthews.com. Uh, that is my website. My books are there. Uh, my, my information is there. That's the easiest way. Uh, I'm Dr. Marcus Matthews on LinkedIn, and I'm, I'm easy to find. I, I'm still uh, right up the street from the neighborhood where I grew up. Uh, not hard to find at all. And, and I think, too, Doc, is that it's really important for people to understand this is a journey. This is a there is no finish line. We do not become the most trauma informed, trauma informed school in the world of trauma informed education. That it's a continual adjustment a, and reflection and, and innovation. And, and I think people need to know that. I think that, you know, right now there's programs everywhere on trauma informed education. You can find every big educational uh, uh, company trying to push. Let trauma Matt, Matt, let me stop you right there. Let me yeah. stop you right there. Yeah. Uh, there's one thing to go to it. There's another thing to go through it. That's and it. What, what my issue is, you know, I'm, I'm from the hood. I'm from the hood, Matt. I might, I, and I'm, 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 I might sound like it right now because you just touched the spot right there. Okay. So we have these so-called urban studies degrees. And, and I look, I, I have all the respect for people who go and seek out education. But if you have not been in those trenches, there is a level of credit that you are not privy to. And so we, we have people that, that, that walk into a room and once you start talking, you understand that these people really don't get it. They've, they've, done, the, they've done the homework. You know, my, my A score is six. I, I grew up in an urban environment, you know, so I taught in urban environments. When I was at Hamilton High School, we had the, uh, our infant mortality rate was that of a third world country. So when, when we're talking about people who have been through it, leading, if, if I'm getting on a plane, I, I want a pilot who's flown before. If I'm going out into the wilderness, I want somebody who's done some camping, right? If my son is a Boy Scout, I'm, I want to make sure that the Scout leader, this isn't his first rodeo. And so when we look at who's doing the training, a lot of times we got people who, you know, they're opportunists. And, and some of their hearts are likely in the right places. And, and I'm cool with that. You all need to partner with people who know it, though. Right. And, and, and that's what even when we look at social injustice and I have white friends and I like to be able to say that, you know, you always talk about, you know, white people saying I have black friends. Well, you know, I, I got white friends. Hey. And so well, for my white friends who say, what can I do? I say, go talk to your white friends. Yeah. Go talk to your white racist family members because they don't want to talk to me. Right. And so it, it works the same way. If you're trying to go out and help traumatized kids, if you're trying to help socially uh, disadvantaged kids, educationally disadvantaged, low income kids, you got to get people who came from there. It, you have to. Otherwise, the job is still not going to get done, you know, and, and so that's what I'm, I'm looking for partnership opportunities. You know, and, and I, I really appreciate you, Matt, for reaching out to me. We've been friends on Facebook now for quite some time. You're doing great work. And, and this is the kind of partnership that we have to have. The same way we're both friends with Jim, you know, and, and I, I reference his book, The Trauma Informed School, in my book, Urban Aces. Those are the kind of partnerships we got to have. And we, we've got to do work together. We've got to go out into communities because the thing is, we, we, we can say we don't see color. That's a lie unless you're blind. If you're not blind, you see. So there are people who will listen to you, Matt, and they won't listen to me. And there are people who will listen to me and they won't listen to you. So if we want to really be successful, we've got to work together. Collaboration trumps competition.
Right. So we, we've got to come together. And, and that that's what the call is. And, you know, you touched on another point when you're talking about where we are with COVID. When students finally get back into classrooms full time. The need for trauma informed care will have multiplied exponentially from where it was one year ago when we sent everyone home. Students and, and you know, I hate to you when you really start talking about it, and it gets ugly under there when you talk about five and six year old boys and girls being raped by their parents and then being sent to school. Being abused by uncles and aunties. And guess what? That abuse has multiplied because school was their place to get away. They went to school so that they could not have to deal with being beaten or touched or cursed out. And so for the last 365 days almost, we had students who've been at home experiencing heavier levels of trauma than ever before. And we have to be ready, you know, and, and, you know, honestly, I say that we were given this rest so that we could be ready. You know, many of us have focused on self-care. And that's one thing that I've really uh, impressed with, with teachers who are able to teach from home. You know, even though the level of work is still there, you still have to prepare lessons and you still have to execute. But you don't have to drive an hour both ways. You know, you, you don't have to fight traffic. You don't have to get up. And, and do all of those things. So you get a little extra time. That's about to end. Things are coming back around. You know, uh, states are lifting bans and, and governors are asking teachers and districts to go back to work full time in the building with the children. And we need to be ready for those children. And I mean, I th you're hitting the nail on the head, right? It's, and here's what I think is interesting, Doc, is that for schools like mine that have been doing this for several years, our success was on the trajectory prior to COVID and COVID didn't slow us down. We valued relationships prior to COVID. We value relationships during COVID. We value relationships post COVID, right? And I think that the schools that maybe didn't invest, they were in full panic mode of what are we going to do? And I'm going to tell you, my team at the school stayed steadfast. We made sure we called every kid every week. We had a navigator program. I personally called every kid the first two weeks of COVID a year ago, starting today, when the tornado went through Nashville, literally yesterday, one year ago. Today, I was chopping trees with one of my teachers with a chainsaw in North Nashville. I mean, this work has to continue. Now, here's what I, and I haven't really spoken about this on my podcast, but I, I, I've been, it's been brewing in my head for a long time. I find it very interesting, one, that we have legislation in our own state right now at the brink of COVID, right? That is right. putting us back when we know kids are going to come back with trauma and they're going to come back escalated due to just the disruption of their normal life, right? Whatever right. that be, whether affluent, whether from a underserved community. But here's something that I find interesting. I've only worked in Title I schools my whole career. And, and what I say is, and a friend of mine, Dr. Ricky Gibbs, says Title I just tells you how it eat, how kids eat. It doesn't tell you how they learn, right? Right. It is what I want to say. All of a sudden now we have this, this angst and this built up worry about learning loss. But yet kid adversity, especially in some of our highest need schools, isn't new. This isn't new of a disruption of education. It's not new. It's just new for the majority, right? Now that everybody has experienced it, now it becomes an issue. And to me, there's something that is fire in my chest of going, we've been having these conversations my whole career. There's people have these conversations the whole career that there are large subsets of children who have experienced disruption their whole lives. And so it just drives me insane when we talk about the learning loss, when we know kids, especially in, in disenfranchised areas and disenfranchised community, this isn't a new concept, right? That there's been a disruption. Man, it is a true privilege to be able to live in such a way where you do not directly feel the impact of poverty. It is a privilege to live in a way when you do not directly 
feel the impact of abuse, neglect. That, that it's a true privilege. And so when, when we think about what, what that means, you know, I, I was just talking to my brother who's also an educator yesterday. And, and, you know, we would hold the, what if I went to this school conversation and, you know, what would life have been like? And for, for, for a, a certain population, for a certain percentage, they haven't had those struggles. And so 2020 has been the year of, of vision, right? It was the year of vision. And, and we were able to see some things that we weren't able to see before. Even when we make the same connection with social justice, the police have been killing people in the streets. And, and you know what? And I, when I say that, I, I want to make sure that I am saying I, I'm glad that we have law and order. I'm glad that we do have a policing system where people can feel safe, right? But I'm also saying that there have been bad apples from the beginning. Even if we go back to the beginning of how um, policing was even brought to be with, with slave catchers, right? And how it went from catching slaves to uh, the, the, what the system we have now. But I, go back to Emmett Till, right? He was killed by law enforcement. It never stopped. It never stopped. It stopped being highlighted. It stopped being shown, but the, the killings never stop. Uh, and the same words for education and, and the lack of education. There, there, there have been poor educational systems since the beginning. When you look at 1865 and the Emancipation Proclamation, and, and one of the first things that, and, and you know, this is not just black and white, because there were white people who were illiterate too. But, you know, we just kind of put a pin at that time because the number of students, the, the enrollment went way up, right? Because now you got black people who also can seek education. So you, you had such an enormous population of people who couldn't read, write, and do arithmetic, right? And that has not stopped. That's where the achievement gap started. The achievement gap has been here at least since 1865. Which, which I changed the name. I don't even call it an achievement gap. It's an opportunity gap, right? Or it's an experience gap. Or, and when I say opportunity, I don't mean like, you know, give an opportunity. No, Exposure like- Exposure gap. That's exactly right. Like we, we continue to talk about my child, the 10 year old that lives in my house versus a 10 year old that I have at my school right now that literally was escalated this morning because she's homeless have two completely different opportunities, but yet they're held to the same exact standard when we come to school, right? Now in the state of Tennessee, that's gonna include behavior. And yep. this is what just, I know, I know we could talk about this for days, but you're right. And, and it's time to, and, and, and I have a hashtag, disruptors unite, right? It's time that we come together and disrupt the system, right? And that means people are gonna be uncomfortable. That means conversations like you and I are having right now there might be people watching on the other end going, whoo, this is intense. Yeah, it needs to be intense, right? It needs to be uncomfortable because that's where growth happens. It's not when we all sit around and agree. It's when people sit around and we disagree. And by the way, we don't disagree on anything that you're saying at all. But it's time to have conversation because we have to for when you have a child, for my child, for the kids in my building. I know my parents are, are older and my mom says, where, like, why do you keep fighting these fights? And I said, because every day I look into the face of 325 kids that, that, that are teaching me. I just happen to be their principal. And that's why I fight the fight because I want a better world for them and my own 10 year old. And so I love the encouragement that you're giving. I love the, the fire that you bring. And, you know, the, the fire, is, it comes from the building because the building is on fire. And, yeah. and for me, I'm, I'm running back in the building, Matt, and I'm trying to rescue as many people from the building as, as I can. And, and to me, that's the way I, I looked at teaching. And now instead of running in the building, I'm trying to help. I'm trying to get more people to run back in the building to get more people out 
because the building is on fire. And, you know, of course, we need to put out the fire. You know, we, we need to re recover the, the condition of the building. But in the meantime, we need to save people. We need to save people. And that's what it's about right now. It really is life or death. When I think about, you know, those cliches that are out there, Matt, about being dead or in jail, my friends really are dead and in jail. Like, it's, it's, it is what it is with me. You know, and I also have friends who are pharmacists and engineers and entrepreneurs, right? But most of those are people I met in college. And then there are a handful of people that grew up in the same neighborhood with me and we are tight, right? We are, we, we tied in a pan of holes, two sizes small because we know that we're, we're, we're a small class. So when, when I think about my friends who are deceased, my brother was murdered when I was 16 years old, Matt. So when, when I think about it, and, 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 you know, in Urban Aces, I tell some of these stories as well. You know, people who were just as smart as I was, if not smarter than I was, but they didn't have the parental support. And, you know, now they're incarcerated or they're just living from, from fist to mouth, from check to check. And so... We for for I know it's real. I've seen it, but we can overcome. We can have success. We just have to support our children. We have to give them the support they need when they struggle. We have to teach them what they need to know. We have to use discipline as a tool to teach and not to give consequences and punish. Absolutely. And man, I, you know, I said it's going to be 45 minutes. We're almost in an hour. And I know Doc, that we could go on for another hour and we might just have to. And at, there's this couple of guests that I think I'm going to have three or four people together. And I already have in my brain two people that I'm ready to line up with you and we can all have a conversation because it's a conversation that needs to happen. And I appreciate you coming on here. I appreciate you sharing your knowledge, your experience and being vulnerable because you shared some very, very uh, uh, close things to you and vulnerability, I think may, helps us all grow. So Thank you so much. I know you're on LinkedIn. Are you on? Yeah, I know you're on Facebook. Are you on any other social media that people can follow you on to follow your work? Yeah, uh, I am on Instagram. I'm primarily uh, LinkedIn. Uh, I, I really Facebook is usually now author ML Matthews is my fan page on Facebook. Uh, and then there's my website, MarcusLMatthews.com. Uh, between my website and LinkedIn, those are the top ways to get in touch with me. Oh, my YouTube page is also uh, Dr. Marcus Matthews. So you can find me on YouTube as well. Awesome. Well, and uh, to remind all the listeners to the Trauma Informed Educators Network Conference, um, should have been year three, it's actually year two, uh, is going to happen July 19th to the 21st. It's going to be virtual this year. We just aren't ready to bring it back in person. It is the Trauma Informed Educators Network Conference Enacting Equity. We have two amazing keynote speakers, both friend of mine, Dr. Ricky Gibbs from Warner Elementary School doing amazing things, and Charles Holt, who was um, in The Lion King on Broadway, grew up in North Nashville, a great friend of mine as well. We have a panel of, of amazing uh, uh, experts in the field, and we have 48 sessions uh, for you to join. It is only $125. For all three days, we are not getting rich by any means. We are strictly trying to move this work. So please, if you want to join that, get registered soon because the tickets are going very quickly. It is a very small conference by design. Again, we're not doing it for any other reason to the push this work. If you want to follow me, I am Matthew Portel on Facebook. I am Principal List on Twitter and Instagram. And Doc, you are the first person ever on this podcast that we got to stream on LinkedIn because I was finally approved to live stream on LinkedIn. So uh, you are the first. So thank you all for listening. And as always, please, please, please wear a mask and wash your hands. Thank you all for listening.